came into philosophy at a time when it was no longer unusual to encounter women philosophers, but when nobody thought it at all remarkable to teach an entire philosophy course without including a single woman on the syllabus. I was trained in a philosophy department where analytic philosophy reigned supreme. The idea of women's voices was something I encountered occasionally in political philosophy through the work of feminist theorists who critiqued liberal theory for its reification of the gender division of the, between the private and the public or in standpoint epistemology through feminist work on ways of knowing. I did not feel that my voice as a woman in a discipline still dominated by men was silenced. I was encouraged on my academic journey by mentors of both sexes who helped me to find my voice and to hone it into scholarly outputs. One senior male professor gently dissuaded me from focusing on reproductive labor and child rearing in my PhD proposal on the grounds that it would pigeonhole me as a feminist theorist and restrict my future employment prospects in the discipline. At the time, I thought he was just being helpful. <laughs> and so I carried on doing the things that academic philosophers do and I was not silenced. Meanwhile, although I had imbibed feminism with my second wave mother's milk, the ravages of patriarchy, it seemed, were mostly things that happened to other women. I had never been raped, never needed to access abortion services. None of the men in my life were abusive or violent. The nearest thing I experienced to a sexual assault was a flasher who startled me and my friend in a park at the age of 13. We were scared, but also a bit embarrassed by the incident and so we didn't make a fuss about it. And so I did my PhD and pursued an academic career, working part-time for the first few years so that I could take my children to and from nursery and school. Feminism was not the main focus of my work or of my political activism, but women academics became the closest thing I had to a support group at times of personal crisis and professional challenge. At one point, early in my academic career, I got an invitation to join a forum for supporting women in academic leadership. The inaugural event was an eight o'clock breakfast meeting that I couldn't attend because I had to take my children to school. But I wasn't silenced. I carried on doing the things that academic philosophers do. I tried out ideas, tried to formulate arguments, and responded to other people's ideas and arguments, mostly good-naturedly, sometimes playing devil's advocate, sometimes with humor, sometimes with anger. We played the game that philosophers play of testing our intuitions. Other people's intuitions didn't always match mine, and other people's conclusions sometimes forced me to consider my own intuitions. At no point, no matter how obscure, preposterous, personal or political the topic of our conversation, did anyone say to me, you can't say that. At no point did I stop myself from following an intuition through by thinking, I can't say that. I wasn't silenced. When I first became aware of proposals to allow people to change their legal sex through self-ID, my intuition was that these ideas were conceptually incoherent scientifically illiterate and politically dangerous. I tried to do what I had been trained to do as a philosopher. I tested these intuitions out in conversations with friends and colleagues. This became harder and harder to do and more and more emotionally and intellectually exhausting. Often it was easier to just not say anything. But I wasn't silenced. I read more and I tried to understand the arguments. I was accused of being a bigot, of being out of touch, of failing to show solidarity with an oppressed group, of enabling far-right ideology. In time, as I discovered the voices of women who had been in this battle for far longer than me, I became better at rebutting these accusations, at least in my head. The solidarity and friendship of newfound feminist allies compensated for the loss of other friendships, the disinvitations from academic events, the slurs on my reputation, and the fear in the face of threats. And it gave me the courage to keep speaking, and I wasn't silenced. But even if I, as I found the courage to say the things that were becoming increasingly unsayable, I became more and more aware of exactly what kinds of things we weren't supposed to say, what words provoked the most vicious accusations. 
the very phrases that struck me viscerally as deeply wrong and offensive, the reference to sex assigned at birth, to gendered souls, to lady dick, were the same things that were regarded as key markers of inclusivity by my opponents. To reject them was to exclude. To name the female body, to invoke the idea that we are all sexed, embodied beings, was to invite accusations of the most heinous of philosophical crimes, essentialism. The analytic philosophical training that had stood me in good stead through years of arguing about political and moral ideas was suddenly dismissed as useless when it was combined with reference to the female body. Why are you so obsessed with the body? I was asked by friends defending the idea that trans women are women because they feel like women. Are you saying that a woman born without a uterus is not a woman? Came the predictable retort when I mentioned reproductive functions and female anatomy. Wittgenstein asks us to focus our attention on what it makes sense to say. Does it make sense, I asked, to use the phrase, a man born without a uterus, or a woman born without a prostate? The fact that the phrase, a woman without a uterus, makes sense in our everyday language, whereas the other two phrases don't, is telling us something important about our concepts and about the material reality that they name. But Wittgenstein and ordinary language philosophy were impotent in the face of the crime of naming the sexed body. And suddenly it all began to fall into place. The activists accusing us of being obsessed with genitals were all of a piece with the male professor who had asked me, why do you want to focus on reproductive labor in your PhD? My unease with insisting that my being a woman was nothing to do with how I felt or what I liked or how I spent my leisure time and everything to do with having a female body was of a piece with the unease that I'd felt age 13 at speaking about the man who exposed his penis to us in a park. The feminists eloquently arguing that we could fight gender stereotypes and oppression without turning the female body into a battleground, were failing to see that the female body has always been the battleground. It is a... It is our female bodies that are the focus of centuries of subjugation by religious zealots, of menstruation huts, of genital mutilation, of sex selective abortion, of rape as a weapon of war, of forced marriage, of the porn industry, of, of sex trafficking, and telling us not to speak about our bodies, not to name them, not to insist that we are all, all of us, embodied beings, and that it is the oppressive system of gender imposed on our bodies and not our bodies themselves which are the problem, that what we have to get rid of is gender, not bits of our bodies. This is all of a piece with the age-old attempts to control our bodies. So no, I have not been silenced, but I have come to a better understanding of what it is that we are supposed to be silent about and why. Thank you.